Well, Father, we thank you for this day that we can come together, hear your word, understand your word, because your spirit abides in us. It is your spirit that leads and guides us into all truth. Father, we understand that your spirit is our teacher. And so, Father, tonight we just receive from your spirit, your word, your will, your intentions in your word. And Father, we thank you that you have given us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And we thank you, Father, that through your word, by the uh, indwelling of the spirit within us, that we can understand and, and we can see you in your fullness and just how big you are. So, Father, we don't want to limit you in any way. So we thank you tonight that our hearts and our minds are enlarged through your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, tonight's lesson is, now you'll, depends on which, uh, how, well, <laughs> on the top of your page, it should say one of two things, prayer cloths or prayer clothes. <laughs> Now, believe it or not, that wasn't a typo. All right, you will see what I'm talking about. Which, what does yours say? Claws. Claws. Okay, well, you ought to put an E in there because it's prayer clothes. All right? So I told you it was on purpose. We didn't make a mistake on that. <clears throat> We're going to start in Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, talking about prayer clothes. Acts chapter 19, verse 8 says, And he went into the synagogue, and spoke boldly for the space of three months. Now, this is talking about the Apostle Paul. Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, notice what he taught. He didn't teach this doctrine or that doctrine. He taught concerning the kingdom of God. He was continuing the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. That's what he preached was the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. Now, Verse 9, but when divers, or various of them, were hardened and believed not, but spoke evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. <clears throat> now, notice what's going on. He goes there, he starts to preach to them, and after a period of time, the people, some of them were hardened. They did not receive the message. And so when that happened and they started disputing and started, things started going on, then he separated from that place, pulled away the disciples, those who did believe, and began teaching them. And he taught them, actually what it says, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So he was actually teaching in a rented school, you might say. He, he used another place. Verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years. So he stayed there and taught now for two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now notice this. It took Paul two years for everybody in Asia to hear the gospel. Think about that, right? Now that area called Asia is technically the area of Asia that we think of as Asia. But regardless, it was a large area, and therefore the word that he preached went out in that whole area and through the disciples that he trained, and through the people that he was talking to. So the message went out, and everybody there heard it. So that means that we've got a job to do. Amen? Amen? It doesn't say he won them all, but they all heard it. That's the key. You can't make everybody accept it, but you can make sure everybody's heard it. Amen? So, look at verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So that from, now, now he's going to describe these special miracles, part of it. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, this is amazing to me because first off, it's just one, well, two verses. One is God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So first off, this tells us that this was special miracles, unusual miracles. They were not common at that time. Okay? But he wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. But then it says, so much so, or so that to the point that from his body was taken, or were brought unto the sick, handkerchiefs and aprons. So they took things that were on him, with him. People had probably 
gave him some things to hold on to, different things that were going on. And it says, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, I could preach all night on that one verse. Because this verse totally disproves uh, just so much of what is taught about healing. And I'm not specifically talking about healing tonight. I'm trying to show you how the power of God can work and be transmitted and things like that. But part of that transmission is in healing. So here, notice this. Let's just take a moment to, to look at this verse. So let's see what's going on. They come to Paul. They take handkerchiefs and aprons that had been on his body. Either he had laid hands on or they'd been placed on him and he had wore them or carried them somehow. And it doesn't give us details, which means what? The details aren't important, right? If the details were important, the details would have been there. So it's not that the details are important. They're not important. All we do know is that Paul, his body, had had some kind of contact with cloths of different you know, shapes and sizes, different things, handkerchiefs and even aprons. And whenever they took those handkerchiefs and aprons from him, now, obviously, he was not giving them to people that were right there, that these were brought to him, and then he handed to them, and then they were taken to people that were not present. So notice here, though, it says when they took those aprons and handkerchiefs from him, it says the diseases departed from them, the people that had the diseases, and evil spirits went out. So now notice what happened. The sick got healed and devils got cast out. And yet Paul wasn't there. You got that? Think about this. People got healed at a distance when a cloth came near them that had been on Paul's body. So, and whenever Paul gave them to them, <clears throat> I'm sure there were times whenever he said, yeah, this is uh, for that disease that you, you know, your, your niece has or your nephew has or your brother, whatever. Yeah, uh, here's, here's a cloth for my nephew. Would you, would you wear it? Okay. And you say, would you pray over it? It doesn't say he prayed over it. See, we call them prayer cloths. There's nothing in here about prayer. Right? Prayer cloths are usually for healing. Isn't that right? Isn't that why most people bring them? And yet we know you don't pray for healing, right? You command healing. So we really shouldn't call them prayer clause. We ought to call them command clause, <laughs> okay? Or healing clause or something, right? But we shouldn't really call them prayer clause because we really technically don't have to pray over them. Now, uh, we demonstrated, and we'll do it again tonight, of actually how we minister uh, healing through these clause and how it works, and we'll give you some detail on it. But I want you to see this. The amazing thing to me about this is that there's, people have this idea that God has to say, okay, uh, in this crowd of 20 people here, you get it, you don't, you don't, you don't, you do. You get partial but not complete. Uh, I'm going to come back in a couple of days and finish it up. That's the way, no, they wouldn't say that. But that's the way they think God does it based on how they act about it. But, and they think that God has to flip a switch or give some kind of... Um, you know, command or something himself, to, uh, some kind of decision for a person to be healed. And pretty much if you think that way, then you can never pray in faith. You can only pray and then hope and wait, right? So you can't pray the prayer of faith. So we know that that kind of prayer, praying is not right. So here, this verse tells us that these claws, there were people sick somewhere, people that had devils, evil spirits, and these claws would be on Paul's body. They'd be taken from him. And whenever they were either near or put on the people, it doesn't give us details again. <clears throat> and whenever when they were brought near to a person that was sick or had a devil, if they, had a, if they were sick or had a devil, they were healed and or delivered. Right? Now, that, that, uh, do you see how much that differs from the way that generally healing and deliverance is taught? You, you couldn't do deliverance the way most people do it today, with a cloth, right? What is that person going to confess to the cloth? You know, here's my sin, get my sin. You see, I know I'm being facetious. I know it's ridiculous to say it that way. But I'm just trying to get across to you, God's power is and should be demonstrated to a degree that it doesn't matter where the people are. See, we have all these limitations. We have all these ideas about how God works. And here he throws in this monkey wrench, in the middle of all of it, it says, just when you think you got me figured out, watch this. 
you know, I can do it with a cloth that was touching a guy who I worked through. Well, why? Well, it's because the life that we have is in the cloth. Now, whenever these cloths touched Paul's body and they were sent out from him, he didn't have to say, okay, healing power. Healing power, what, what do they need? Oh, I'm sorry, I put a healing in that one. They need deliverance. I'm sorry. Bring it back and let me, let me switch that out. I'll switch out the, the healing power for deliverance power. See, he didn't have to do that. Why? Because it wasn't healing power. It wasn't deliverance power. It was life. And life, light, love, drives out sickness, disease, death. It is like two magnets. You ever see the two magnets? One side, you, you put them one way and they stick together. You turn one around and it's like you can't even hardly make them go together. That's the way the life of God is with sickness and disease. You just can't. I don't, I'm not even sure if they actually ever touch. I think the closer that life gets, the faster that thing gets away. And so that is what we see with Paul here. He, they take these cloths, and notice what these cloths were. There was a handkerchief, but there were also aprons. What do you do with an apron? You wear it, so it's clothing, right? It was a form of clothing. So that's, why I, I, that's one of the reasons why I called this prayer clothes instead of just prayer cloths, because I want you to realize it was clothing. Now, I want to show you some things maybe, <clears throat> maybe you've seen before, Maybe you didn't think about it, or maybe you did. But it says that here the diseases departed them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So it did not matter what they had. That's, what, that's the main point I want to get across in this. You can wear, and people bring me things all the time, a handkerchief and different things, and people have sent uh, T-shirts in for me to wear, and they've sent, uh, recently we had somebody send in a, one of those night things that you put over your eyes when you sleep. And they say, you know, just have Curry sleep with this. I have vision problems, and I want them to sleep with this, and then send it to me. People do that, and I'm going to do it, and we'll send it, and they'll get healed. It's that simple. Amen? Now, you say, why don't you do it another way? I can, but that's where they have set their faith, so I'm going to agree with them, and if any two agree is touching anything, it'll be done. Why not work with them, right? And then they will have a testimony of how they believe God, and it worked. Amen? Amen. So, that doesn't mean I haven't started, already started commanding healing to them. You know, if they are completely healed before we send it back to them and they write or call and say, we don't need it, I'll say, glory to God. Amen? Amen? So, look at now <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 19. And Jesus arose. Now, we went from Acts, from the Apostle Paul, back to Jesus. And you'll see the rest of these are all in a more or less chronological order. Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Verse 20, and behold, a woman which was diseased. Notice the word diseased. It's bold letters there. You can underline that. Diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his what? Garment. garment. Now, what's another word for garment? Clothes. Clothes. Clothing. Exactly. <clears throat> now, for, now notice verse 21, for she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment. In other words, if I don't do anything but touch what he's wearing, if I can get up behind him and just touch just the, the hem of his garment, another passage even says the hem of his garment. If I can just do that, she said, I shall be whole. Right? Then we know the story. Okay. <clears throat> she came up behind him, touched him, and we're going to read it again here in just a minute, but notice when she touched his garment, she said, if I just touch his garment, I shall be whole. <clears throat> and you're going to see, well, let's go ahead and read the next one. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, verse 35. <clears throat> and when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they, plural, <coughs> excuse me, that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. You hear that? <coughs> it's funny because we always emphasize uh, somebody laying hands on us. You know, if I can get to him and get him to lay hands on me, I'll get healed. <coughs> but you'll see here, they went to him and said, if I can touch him, I'll get healed. Now, you'll also notice this is in Matthew chapter 14. <coughs> Man, <coughs> sorry. I've been talking too much today, I guess. <coughs> there we go. <coughs> he said, 
<clears throat> this is Matthew 14. We were in Matthew 9. <clears throat> now, this is a brilliant bit of deduction, but Matthew 14 took place after Matthew 9. All right, okay? Now, <clears throat> so in Matthew 9, we have this woman that comes up, touches the hem of his garment, gets healed. Five chapters later, we have a crowd wanting to touch him. Why do you think they wanted to touch him? Because they heard it worked for the woman. Isn't that right? <clears throat> it spread abroad. Everybody heard, wow, you mean I can touch him? I don't have to get him to touch me? I mean, that's, that's even better because if, if I have to get him to touch me, he might say no. But if I can determine and I can touch him, he can't even tell me no. Isn't that right? I mean, think about it. You know that's the way people think, right? <clears throat> and it said, here everybody was thinking, if I can just touch him, I don't even have to. And th this is one of the main points about this. When Jesus turned around and saw her, you're going to see this in another passage here in just a minute. <clears throat> when he turned around, he didn't even know who got, who, who got healed. Didn't even know. It was a complete surprise to him. He turned around to see who it was that got healed. Now that tells us also that the woman had faith, did what she said, got what she said, literally, and he said, <clears throat> who touched me? And the, his disciples said, Master, look at the crowd. Everybody's touching you. What do you mean? And he said, no, somebody touched me. In other words, somebody got something. All these, and which means the disciples knew everybody was touching him. You mean, and if you've been in a crowd with people like that, everybody's trying to touch you and they're trying to do things. You know, it's all there and they're trying to get, hey, look over here, talk to me, help me. And there's this crowd and you're getting jostled around and his disciples are trying to protect him and there's crowds going on. And then this woman touches him, you know, grabs him as a garment and all of a sudden he's like, whoa, whoa, stop, stop. Somebody touch me. And the disciples, we know everybody's touching him because he said, they said, Lord, look at the crowd. Of course, somebody touched you. And he said, no, somebody touched me. His idea of touch means somebody got something. Because he said I've, he felt virtue, the word power, ability. He felt that go out of him. Now, this is the only time it ever mentions him feeling anything. So number one, what is the basic rule of scripture? In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a thing be established. Isn't that right? So you can't build a doctrine, technically, off of one incident, right? You understand what I'm saying? So here, <clears throat> it said he felt something, so we don't build a doctrine off of him, off of feeling something when we pray for somebody, right? But it did no he, he noticed that, that virtue went out, so he did feel something going out. And now notice, let's go on. Well, they hear that. <clears throat> this woman gets healed, and he turns around and says, woman, your faith has healed you. Right? Because she told him everything she had done. And then that was spread abroad. Why? Because it happened in a crowd. You know the word spread. This woman came behind him, touched him, and he, he didn't even know who touched him. And she got healed. Well, if she can do that, I can do that. I mean, you know, if, she, if you don't have to get permission, if you don't have to find out if it's God's will, if I can just sneak up behind him and touch him, I can get healed. Do you realize how much bigger that makes God? that it wasn't limited to Jesus having to exert power, that somebody could actually pull it from him. And it also shows that he was not technically all-knowing in his earth life because he did not know who touched him. Right? And yet, even though he didn't know who touched him, somebody got healed, which means what? That means that you don't have to, if you have the life of God, the power of God, the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you don't have to know everything to get somebody healed. They can get healed off of things. When I was in Africa, first time I went over 97, there was a, <clears throat> there was a house we were staying in. I wouldn't plan on sharing this, but it kind of applies. <clears throat> and we were coming out, me and a pastor, we were going to go visit some people, pray for some people. And as we came out, we turned a corner, and there was a little place there, like a little walkway, that you had to walk down this narrow area. And there was this really elderly man standing there, and I didn't pay too much attention to him. He was just kind of standing, not really looking at us, but standing away. And there was a little boy right next to him. And whenever we started to walk past him, the little boy said something. I didn't understand what he said. But as soon as he said something, the old man reached out and just kind of put his hand out where I would kind of walk into it. And whenever we touched, he grabbed my shirt. And when he grabbed my shirt sleeve, I automatically, <clears throat> somebody had tried to rob me in Nairobi. So I was a little aware of things going on. And so when he grabbed me, I just kind of put my hands up and turned sideways, which would knock the person's hands off of me. Because nobody asked me if they could touch me. So I was just blocking it off. 
And as soon as I knocked his hand off, I kind of stepped back. And when I did, this old man had his hand out and it knocked his hand off. And he raised his hands and just started looking up. His eyes, his entire eye was milky white, both of them. And while we stood there and watched, he started worshiping God. Tears started coming down his face. And while he was standing there worshiping God and we're watching him and the pastor was trying to talk to him, this man's eyes turned from white to brown to black and started, you could see it. You could see it. On, and this is on a, well, it's not a street corner, but what we would call an, <clears throat> what we would call an alley. And in the space of 15 seconds, probably maybe, maybe 30 at the most, this man went from absolutely completely blind to being able to see, raising his hands, and he turned just to walk off. Didn't say anything, just worshiping God. So the little boy started to go with him, and the pastor grabbed him, pulled him back, and said, what's going on here? What's happening here? And started trying to talk to him. <clears throat> and the little boy said that they had put out these flyers about when I was coming. And they had on there this thing about the white healer and all that. Well, he's, they, the little boy said that God spoke to his grandfather and told him, when the white healer comes, if you will reach out and grab him when he walks past, your eyes will be opened. I didn't know anything. I didn't feel anything. I felt nothing, right? If anything, it was kind of a, what's going on, okay? But I sure wasn't thinking, oh, yeah, power of God, anointing. It wasn't like that. <clears throat> and that old man just walked off. Now, that Sunday, he was in church, and he gave testimony. I got the picture. I think it's the one. It might be over there on the wall. I'm not sure. I got several pictures. The one with me with the little woman. She was demon-possessed. Completely God set her free. The other man there, you'll see him. Uh, he had three fingers missing, and he, during a service, he got his three fingers back. Now, I had nothing to do with that either. I, wouldn't, I didn't pray for him anything. He was, in, he was worshiping, and it happened. And I don't know if I have a picture of the blind guy there, and I don't see it. But I guess I shouldn't call him the blind guy because <clears throat> he's not no more. But, <clears throat> so he didn't grab me, but it was like he was grabbing my clothes. He just kind of brushed across it. So anyway, that's really wasn't part of the message tonight. But you can have life coming out of you. I didn't feel anything. I wasn't exerting anything. I wasn't prayed up, so to speak, in the sense of I'm going to go heal a blind man. It wasn't anything like that. It was just life. And I will tell you this, in 97, I didn't understand a tenth of what I understand today. Not a tenth of it. And so I didn't know to try to direct certain things. Okay, I knew bits and pieces, and I was seeing it, but... Surely hadn't put it together you know, completely yet. Still haven't, just so you know. But in Mark chapter 5, page 2. Mark chapter 5, verse 24. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years. Now you see we're talking about the same person here. And had suffered many things of many physicians. Notice, suffered many things. She had not just been treated by them. She had suffered many things, because especially back then, well, I, I don't know if it's that much different from today and then, to be honest with you, people suffer many things from physicians today too, right? About 40% of the people in our healing lines is me dealing with people that have problems because a doctor messed something up during a surgery, a good 40%. Something went on. I'm not against doctors. I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying they're not infallible and they're not God's way of healing. All right? <clears throat> and had spent all that she had. Well, so there is some similarity between doctors then and now. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Now notice, she felt something and he felt something. Okay, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself, now notice, knowing, that's what it says here. Okay, You'll see it in just a minute. But here he says, knowing in himself, so he knew something that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? 
And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Now think about that. It says she came and fell down. So they had been walking. She touched his garment. He knew within himself virtue had gone out. She knew at the same time she was healed. And it took a bit, and apparently she kind of parted from them, probably kind of fell back into the crowd to try to disappear because she was taking her life in her hands to even be there to begin with. And probably kind of, and there got to be people in between Jesus and her. And he stops and goes, wait, 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 stop, stop. There's something, somebody touched me. And by now, the, it's a whole new crowd there, all new people. And whenever he said that, then she was afraid and she came to him fell down in front of him, now watch this, <clears throat> fell down, the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Came and told him the whole story. This is what has happened. I was over at my house two weeks ago and I knew, I said, well, if, I've been hearing stories about this Jesus. If I, he didn't have to pray for me, if I can just get, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Well, I, you know, sister, how are you ever going to do that? I mean, look at him. He's always surrounded by his 12 bodyguards. He's always surrounded by all these people here. You know, it's hard enough to get to the man. I mean, the man is just swamped all the time. How are you going to get to him? Well, you know, and, and if you, even if you do, what makes you think he'd pray for you? You know, it, it's wrong for you to even approach a rabbi. You know, what makes you think he's going to touch you? If he touches you like he does these other people, he's going to be defiled because that's what they believed. So what makes you think even if you see him, he's going to agree to, to touch you? Well, you know what, maybe I don't have, maybe he didn't have to touch me. Maybe I, if I just sneak up behind him, if I just get up behind him, and if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And so she said within herself, she believed within herself, having the same spirit of faith, she believed and she said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And she did that, and she pulled out of him what Jesus wasn't even trying to give away. You get that? Now, what does that say? That tells me that even if, now listen, it is always God's will to heal, especially now because of the, the atonement and because it's been paid for. But if a woman that was, should have been condemned for what she did, for violating the very law, right, the, the law of God at the time, if she can do that and she can decide how she's going to get healed and she's going to go pull the power of God out of the man of God, and that was then, how much easier should it be now that it's all been paid for, all been done, the devil is defeated, sickness and disease has no right in us now? How much easier should it be for us to be able to say, you know what, I don't even have to touch the hem of his garment. Yep. Right? I should just be able to say, you know what, his spirit lives in me. Yep. And because of that, by his spirit that lives in me, I'm healed. He said it, I believe it, and the body line up with it. Amen? Amen? Now, then in verse 34, And he said unto her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go, notice your faith here, right? Not his faith, not the anointing. You hear that? Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. While, she, while he yet spoke, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble you the master anymore? Now, this is where he was going. He was on his way to raise a dead girl. And so this happened in between. He wasn't even thinking about healing the people there. They were just trying to get to the, to the ruler of the synagogue's house. Mark chapter 6, verse 53. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of the... Gennesaret, land of Gennesaret, and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him, and ran through that whole region round about, and began to carry about in beds those that were sick, where they, when they heard, where they heard he was. Right? So they see him get off the ship. Everybody hears, that's Jesus. He's here. And everybody starts running home and running back to their families and grabbing everybody. He's here. Let's get here. Well, I can't get there. We're here. Let's take you. And they start grabbing everybody up in their beds and started dragging them to Jesus and getting them there as quick as they could because we got to get you. This is your chance. How many, you know, you can imagine what it must have been like. 
When is he ever going to be here again? When was the last time he said, man, he was, he's never been here before. Well, who knows when he's going to return? You got to get there. And they gathered everybody up and brought him to him. And whithersoever he entered, verse 56, into whatever village he entered, our cities, our country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him, now watch what they besought him, that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. What are they asking? They are not saying, will you lay hands on us? They were asking him, can I touch you? Can I just touch the hem of your garment? Why did they specialize that? Why did they... You know, make it so specific. Because word spread. They heard. Right? One little woman's testimony set the entire region on fire with faith. Nobody was doing that. All these people there were touching, but they weren't getting healed. Why? Because they didn't think they could get healed by touching him. One little woman comes in and does it, and all of a sudden now everybody's wanting to touch him with a whole brand new reason. Everybody's wanting to touch him to get healed. Amen? And we've done that. I've done that in, in Africa. I've done it here in the United States where we go in and most people expect, here in America especially, people want us to lay hands on them because that's the accepted norm. It's kind of gotten that way now in Africa too. But I'm telling you, we have gone to these places many times when I went in and especially before I was <clears throat> activating DHTs and having them do the praying at the end of the DHT when I was doing it all myself. There was times when I would just, just mix it up on purpose. And I said, all right, tonight, instead of me laying hands on you, we're going to line you all up right here, and I'm heading straight toward that door. And on my way, I'm going to be walking past, and you just reach out and touch me. When you reach out and touch me, you're going to get healed. I said, there's no difference between you touching me and me touching you. Right? And I said, and that's what we're going to do. And that was what I did. I just walked through the crowd, and people reach out and touch. And I said, well, as soon as you touch me, just know you're healed in Jesus' name. Start acting like it. And we saw healings the same way we do when we lay hands on the sick. We've seen it here. We've seen it in Africa. We've, everywhere we've ever done that, we've seen it. So, matter of fact, I can promise you, in the near future, as we have more healing services going on here, which we're going to be doing, I was talking with the team today, uh, probably next week, we're going to start teaching every day about 2 o'clock on healing, and we're going to broadcast it, and we're going to be able to be here, and people are going to start coming here and hearing it and being ministered to. And as we have more healing, you know, specifically healing services, we are going to be doing this more and more. We're going to do it every possible way there is to show people God is bigger than any formula or any one way. Amen? Amen. So, <clears throat> notice it says, they began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. And whatever city, whatever, wherever he went, whether it's villages, cities, or countries, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. Now watch this. And as many as touched him were made whole. Now what's another way of saying that? He healed them all. You get that? As many as touched him were made whole. So this is another time in the Bible when everybody got healed. Right? And it's not even listed in the he healed them all category. Okay? But everybody still got healed. Over and over again, it says everybody got it. That's what we should be believing for. We ought to be believing everybody gets it. Amen? Amen. We're going to get you all bold and get you trained, get you ready to go and get the life of God and the power of God flowing out of you in a way that you don't, hadn't even expected. Right? And we're going to show you how God does it different ways. And it's, and it's going to get to the point where wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you're going to be able to take a business card, maybe a ministry card or something like that, and you're going to, because that you've been carrying your pocket, you're going to be able to set that thing on the table when you start to leave alongside the, the generous tip that you're going to leave for that server. And they're going to pick that thing up. And when they pick that card up, they're going to feel the power of God in it. And they're going to get healed. They're going to get delivered. They're going to get convicted. They're going to get born again. They're going to call. They're going to look at that number. They're going to call you. And they're going to go, you know what? I don't know what happened. But whenever, uh, remember you were here today and I picked up that tip and you left a business card? When I picked up that business card. That day, all my pain left. That day, this thing happened. You watch. And now, I'm going to show you some illustrations of that here, too. So we're looking at page 3, and let's go to Luke, chapter 8. Starting in verse 43. And a woman, having an issue of blood 12 years, which has been all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, now notice everybody's denying it. 
Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, in other words, her, she had been revealed, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people, I'll try to move that out of the way, there we go, before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Now, look how many times. Now, this is the same story told over and over again, obviously. But notice the different bits and pieces from each one. It gets a little more detailed each time. <clears throat> now, Acts chapter 5, verse 12 says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Verse 13, And of the rest there is no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them, and believers were the more added to the Lord. Why? Because of the many signs and wonders that they saw the apostles doing. They were convinced. Multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, same thing it said about Jesus, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Now, we've talked before about this, and I don't have time tonight to go into it in much detail, but the life of God can be, it's resident within you. It can just be what I would consider almost like maintenance level, which means it's skin level. In other words, it doesn't emanate from you. It just goes as far as your skin because that's maintenance and it's just taking care of you. And you say, well, how would I get it further than that? Easy. Change your believing because everything is believing. Amen? When you change your believing, everything changes. What you change your believing to, your experience changes to. And now that's, that's the first thing. Another good way of having the Spirit of God emanate from you greater is by speaking in other tongues. You start speaking in other tongues and it generates, it charges, and it starts to reach out further. But you have to believe that it reaches out further. Right? You have to get it settled in you. When I walk around, the Spirit of God is in me and He emanates from me just like light emanates from a light bulb. Amen? Amen. We are the light. Now think about this. We are the light of this world. Isn't that what Jesus said? We are the light of this world. If we are the light... Now, we would say, um, we would say it today, uh, something along the lines of, we are the light bulb okay, for this world. In other words, the, we are the container of it, but there's, the, the value of a light bulb is not that the light is in the bulb. The value of the light bulb is that the light extends past the bulb. Did you get that? If a light doesn't go past the bulb, the bulb isn't much good. Okay? So don't just be the light of the world and don't just be a light bulb that has the light, but let the light shine. Now, we don't want to be some, you know, 20 watt, 40 watt, uh, you know, green energy light bulb. Okay? We, we want to be this 110 watt, 100 watt, you know, these, not just the uh, floodlights. That's what we want, floodlights. That's what we're looking for. Amen? We want to be floodlights in this world to the point where, yeah, the light is out there and it brightens up, but it can also be directed. Amen? And matter of fact, if you get near some of these lights up here, I, I guarantee you stand up here very long, you start feeling the heat off of it. Right? Now, what most people would call that heat, in our terms of what we're talking about, is the anointing. Right? That's what they would call it. Well, that heat is just the anointing. I feel it. You know, I can feel the effects of that light. Well, wherever you go, you should have that light in you and emanating from you so that people around you feel the effects. And when they do, they'll start talking about how anointed you are. And you go, yeah, I'm just a light bulb. You know, just shining my light. That's what I'm doing. Amen? Now, he says here, because I want to move on pretty quick. Uh, Acts, yeah, let's see where I'm at here. Yeah, go down to verse, we're in verse 15. I'll, I'll read that again. 
insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits. And look at this next part. And they were healed every one. Right? Now, notice, it doesn't say that they laid hands on them. Matter of fact, what it says is they laid them in the street, hoping that the shadow of, these, of Peter and the apostles might overshadow them, actually lending us to believe it had more to do with the emanation of the Spirit healing them than it did actually laying hands on them. Amen? It doesn't say anybody touched anybody. Now, it says that my, uh, at the very beginning, it says many signs and wonders were wrought among the people through the hands of the apostles. So there could have been hands laid on them. But I'm just saying in this case, it does not say that, so we can't say that. Right? But somehow the people were healed because it says every one of them were healed. So however it happened, in the, in the intimation here, is that it was the overshadowing of them. In other words, Peter got close enough to them, the apostles got close enough <clears throat> that the power of God emanated from them and got them healed. Imagine you reaching for a guy in a wheelchair and he jumps up before you get your hand on him. Amen? Now, if you pull him out of the wheelchair, God will get some glory. Honestly, you'll get some glory too. That's just human nature. But if you're in the area, if you're around him, you come over to him and go, what, what can I do for you? Well, I want to be healed. All right, and you step toward him, all of a sudden, bam, and they jump up. Who's going to get the most glory out of that? God. Why? Because you didn't touch him. Amen? Even though it was still the Spirit of God in you, they got close enough to him to get the job done. Amen? Amen? So, now let's talk about a couple of testimonies here. Testimony of power transmitted to inanimate objects. Now, we all know the testimonies that people have, uh, that, or that we've read about uh, the, what people call the anointing in the bones of Elijah, right? <clears throat> and, or Elisha. And we know that this power can, can remain resident, okay? But if you look at this on your paper, it has testimonies of power transmitted to inanimate objects. First off, you have John Lake. Now, this is back in 1908 into 19, up to 1913. At one point, they were so overwhelmed with the needs of the people that they had to break away and try to get a rest. So they, they go a distance from Johannesburg, and they're up on a cliff, basically, and they stop to rest. And they look down, they see this village, and they said, let's go down there and get something to eat and get some rest. And so they go down into the village, and people find out they were there and that these were a couple of the men that were having this mighty revival going on. And so all, all of a sudden, of course, the people said, well, hey, you're here, pray. And, and here they are trying to get a rest. And these people are pressing them, pray. You got to pray for me, just pray for me. Wait, you can't turn them away. So John Lake said, you know, if we stay here, we're not going to get any rest. So here's what we'll do. And in uh, South Africa, the villages there are sometimes called kraals. K-R-A-L-L. -L. It a, it's a means a village. And in the middle of this village, there would be a post. And they would tie horses to it or animals to it at times. And in the old days, they would tie the whatever they're going to sacrifice there. And they would tie the animal up there, and then they would cut its throat and you know, let it bleed out. And so John Lake saw that pole out in the middle. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We need rest. You need healing. They went out to the middle, he put his hands on it, so did the other man that was with him. They put their hands on his post, and then they started declaring, everybody that touches this post will be healed in Jesus' name. <clears throat> then they stepped back, people lined up, started coming up and touching the post and getting healed. Then they said, okay, we're done, we're going to go get some rest. They left, and over the next week, it was reported that it was up to 70,000 people walked past that post, touched it, and was healed in a week's time, a week to two weeks. Now, by that time, he had made it back to Johannesburg, and they started getting the testimonies back in. Now, I've been in, in uh, Johannesburg. We have went into the archives there. I've got copies now of all of the newspapers that John Lake sent out during that time where they testified to these things and started getting the testimonies back in, <clears throat> and we're going to start putting those things out. Now, Another aspect, one more thing to give you about John Lake when he was in South Africa. 
they started a newspaper there for the Apostolic Faith Mission, which was their church there. And when they started that mission, they started putting out newspapers. And those newspapers were originally called uh, the Truster, which is, was an uh, Afrikaner's or a Dutch name for, it, it meant the comforter. And then they started putting it in Dutch, and they put it in Afrikaans, and they put it in, uh, in English. <clears throat> and they called it the comforter. And they started printing these newspapers, and they started stacking them up. Now, they, when they started having the revival, it started hitting pretty strong. And there were several thousand people there uh, locally, that, and they started having meetings around the city every night. And these ministers, they didn't have one church that they came to. The ministers would go to different houses every night, and sometimes even some churches that were getting converted. And they would go there and preach for a little bit, pray for the sick, and then just tell people, start praying and re receive the baptism of the Spirit. And then they, when the people started receiving the baptism of the Spirit and started speaking other tongues, then they'd say, okay, y'all got it. And they would leave and go to another house, and they just did that. They did it every night. And they, they had this small group of missionaries that were going from house to house, from church to church, and having these meetings. Well, at one point, to try to let everybody know what was going on, they started keeping record of it. And they started sending out these newspapers. So at one point, they got to a place where they were printing 50,000 copies of these newspapers a week. Now think about that, 50,000 a week, because the demand was there partially, but also because that was their outreach. They made these copies. All of them had testimonies. They had some teaching in it, but most of it was testimonies. And then they had these things printed. And then when they had them printed, it was amazing because they would print 50,000 copies a week. They would bring them in, stack them up on the platform, and they would get the, the ministers there. They would all gather around, lay their hands on these newspapers, begin to pray, pray that healing would take place, pray that people would be delivered, that salvations would take place. And they were all basing this off of Acts 19.12, <clears throat> that they would lay hands on them and that wherever these papers went, people would be healed, delivered, whatever needed to be done, God could do. Then they sent these papers out, and they had, um, when they got to the house, there was testimonies that I've read in some of these newspapers where this one, especially this one woman I'm thinking about, she said, uh, I came home the other day, and your newspaper was on my stoop, on my doorstep. And she said, whenever I saw it, I knew it was from you, so I was glad to receive it. And she said, I picked it up, and when I picked it up, I started shaking. And she said, whenever I started shaking, I had severe rheumatoid arthritis. And she said, whenever I stopped shaking, the arthritis was gone. And that was from a newspaper that someone put at her doorstep. Nobody went up there, put their hands on it, and said, all right, rheumatoid arthritis, you have to go. And then laid that newspaper down. They just said, the life of God, whatever the people need, they can get it from God because we release his spirit. Now, that was with a newspaper. This, uh, these things happen so often that after about, I think it was within about two months, they started telling people, at first they would tell everybody, we want all your testimonies. Then they started saying, okay, we only want the testimonies that are of the unusual nature because we're getting so many common testimonies that it has to be something unusual for us to include it in our newspaper. Think about that. Think about tell, telling people, uh, yeah, we know you've been healed, and that's expected, but now we're talking about if you were born without a limb and it's grown back. We want those kind of testimonies. Think about that. Now, how many of you know God isn't any different today than he was in 1908? The same God, same spirit, amen, same power. Everything is there. Now, so if God's the same, what could be the only thing that's changed? The church, right? And if we believe what they believed, and we believe in God the way they believed in God, and expect God to do what they expected God to do, how many of you know that God will show up and do what he said he would do? Amen? Amen. Now, I'll give you a couple more. And those were the ones of John Lake. Those are more, um, well, I mean, we've got evidence of them. But I wasn't there, so I wasn't an eyewitness to it. So I'm going to give you a couple here. Uh, many of you have heard some of these testimonies anyway, though. There was a man in a Florida nursing home that 
called up. I was gone at the time, as a matter of fact. My wife took the call, and he had a withered arm. His arm was drawn up, and his daughter called up and said, I need a T-shirt or I need a uh, prayer cloth for my dad, and didn't say what it was, didn't give us the, the details. I was gone. My wife went to my closet. We didn't have any prayer cloth. I hadn't prayed over any and left them or anything, but my wife went to my closet took a, as I always tell everybody, took a perfectly good shirt and cut the sleeve off, right? And sent them the entire sleeve. Didn't cut it in little pieces. Sent the entire sleeve. Now, my wife didn't know what was wrong with this guy. But she also didn't know that she was being led by the Spirit. Because whenever the man got, whenever the woman got the sleeve in the mail, she went to the nursing home and she cut the left sleeve off of my shirt and it was his left arm that was withered up. And so she put the sleeve all the way up and he had on a t-shirt and she uh, used a safety pin and pinned the sleeve up to his shirt and left it on him and told the nurses there, said, leave this on him. And they said, what is that? And she said, don't worry about it, just leave it on him. And she said, they thought I was crazy, but I told them, I'm paying the bills, so leave it on him. And so she... They left it on him. The next morning, whenever she came back in to visit her dad, when, he, when she walked through the door, he looked over, saw her, and the first thing he did was reach out and wave at her with his left hand. Amen? Amen. Now, that, that, when that happened, the nurses started saying, what's going on? What happened here? And she said, this is what happened. And they told him, and she told her what, how she got this sleeve. And they said, well, what, what was in that sleeve? And this woman responded and said, just the arm of an anointed man of God. Right? Well, now this shirt, now let's, let's be real practical. The shirt had been washed. Right? It was a clean shirt. I had not worn it since it had been washed. So we know the anointing doesn't wash out. All right? Not even with Tide. Okay? <laughs> I don't know if she used Tide or what, but, but we know that it had nothing to do with praying over that cloth, because we didn't. There was nothing special about the cloth, but I had worn it. Now, after that, I could give you a whole bunch of stories, because I, I remember some others that were going. I think most of them are here. Uh, the next one that's listed here was a man in Tom's River, New Jersey. Went to a church there and had the DHT, then had a healing service. And then at the end of the healing service, we were walking through the crowd and just kind of praying for people and talking to people. And these people came up and had a bandana. Uh, it was a red bandana, and they had been watching some David Hogan videos, and they were, you know, popping everybody and yelling fuego and everything that David does. And so they had this bandana, and they came, brought it to me and said, we're going to take this to, I think it was her dad. I think it was the wife's dad. And said, uh, we're going to take this bandana. He has uh, Alzheimer. I think it was Alzheimer. Yeah, yeah. He had Alzheimer. And we're going to take this to him, so I want you to pray over it. We're going to take it to him tonight. We're going to take it directly to him, put it on him, because we believe he's going to be healed. And so they took it over to this man, and they didn't put it on him. They wrapped it around his neck, you know, just like a bandana, and just tied it around him. And they said when they walked in, this man had had no recognition for, for some time. And they said they would walk in, and he'd just be sitting in his wheelchair and just wouldn't show any reaction whatsoever. And they tied this around his neck, and they all just kind of sat there. And, and, you know, they would try to talk to him because they believe he was in there, but just wouldn't recognize him. And they started talking to him, and they said he was just sitting there like normal, just wasn't listening, you know, wasn't paying attention. And all of a sudden, they said he looked up and looked surprised, and it, like he was scared, and started saying, Jesus, what do you want? What do you want? And he was carrying on this conversation, and he was seeing Jesus. And they were looking, they, they thought, you know, either he's seeing Jesus or he's really lost it. You know, he's just gone now. And they said, but he started shaking. And whenever he quit shaking, he looked around at them, called him by name, and his mind was completely restored. Amen? Now, word of that started spreading because the testimony came in and we started telling people about it. So guess what I started getting? I started getting all kinds of handkerchiefs and bandanas and stuff in the mail. And they would come in and we'd pray over them and send them back. And there was a woman in um, Springfield, Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we knew this woman. I believe her first name was Janie. I believe it was. Um, she had, my wife and her had become friends. And out of nowhere, I mean, we'd known her for a while. 
And all of a sudden, she wrote in one day and said, I've been diagnosed with, with cancer. And she had a brain tumor. And this was very bad. And by the time we heard about it, she had already gone through chemo, like one, one or two rounds of chemo, uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was bad. And she didn't contact us right at first, but you know, actually later she said it was out of fear that she had heard this. And so she, out of fear, she went through with what she was told. So she wanted a, this bandana and she sent a bandana to us. We prayed over it, sent it back. <clears throat> I remember, because we went through Springfield and saw her, when we met her, there she had the bandana tied around her head like a, what do they call it, do-rag, I guess they call it, whatever it is, but they had it on her head because she had lost her hair due to the chemo and everything, and so she just wore that instead. And when we saw her, she was looking better. I mean, you know, she, you could, she still didn't have any hair, but her color was good, better. And so we left, uh, we did pray for her while we were there, but she was, you could tell she was already getting better. And then we got back home later, she wrote us a letter and said, I want you to know I'm completely cancer free. And she says, as a matter of fact, I've already passed the bandana to another person in our, they had a support group for uh, cancer survivors basically. <clears throat> and she said, I've already passed that to, to another person and they, they've already reported that they are healed. And so now they want to pass it to somebody else. But now the question is, when do we need to send this back in to get it recharged? <laughs> and and I, I told him, I said, oh, I, I don't know. I said, I guess if it ever stops working, send it back. We'll send you another one. We'll recharge you, whatever it is. You know? But she just kept, and see, again, I, I learn from these things. I don't just do them and go, wow, that's a special miracle. or that's a, I, mean, I learn from them because I started realizing this, we sent it specifically to this woman, specifically for that problem. And she passed it around to two or three other people, and they all had different things. Well, I mean, I think one or two of them also had cancer, but different kinds of cancer. And then another one, I think, had one something different, and then another one had something totally different. And they all got healed by the same cloth. You understand when I say that? It's all by the Spirit of God. But I'm trying to emphasize, we didn't pray differently over each one it was the life of God, the Spirit of God, that did it. Now, I don't have any problem with praying over cloths and laying hands on them and, as we would say, releasing life. But my heart's desire is that we could bypass that step and just realize it's the Spirit of God doing it. Amen? And let's just go right to Him and not have to rely on somebody else's, you know, having that Spirit put into a cloth. But let's just recognize... I have the Spirit of God. You have the Spirit of God. Let's let the Spirit of God in us out into our flesh to drive out sickness and disease and anything else that you need, right? Anything else that you don't want, put it that way. So then, uh, actually a couple of years ago, uh, several years back, we had some friends and his wife. Actually, it was the woman that I, you might have heard me tell the story before too, where this woman was, um, she was a nurse, here at the Children's Hospital here in Dallas. <clears throat> and her husband contacted me. We went to eat somewhere. And with me and my wife and him and his wife, we went in. It was a Cheddar's. I'll tell you where it was at. <clears throat> and we went to a Cheddar's. And when we were ordering, she didn't order. His wife did not order. And so whenever they brought the food, I noticed she opened her purse and took out this food. It was a sandwich. And opened it up and was eating it. And I thought, okay, that's... Strange, but you know, I don't like to embarrass people or say anything, so I didn't say anything. We get done, <clears throat> and we go out to the car, and their car's next to my car, and we're standing in the parking lot at a Cheddar's, and this man says, uh, <clears throat> this was a Saturday. He said, if I bring my wife to church tomorrow, can you pray for her? I said, well, what's, uh, what's the problem? He said, she has thyroid cancer. <clears throat> her, They've already removed her parathyroid glands and they said that that didn't stop it so they're going to have to do more <clears throat> and I said well is there any reason you want to wait till tomorrow or can we do it right now and he said well, can we do it right now and I said I'm no more anointed behind the pulpit than I am right here in the parking lot I said it's all the spirit of God and he doesn't care <clears throat> and I said why spend one more night with the frogs if you know the old story from I think it was uh, Jesse Duplantis so why would you want to do that? Let's just deal with it now. And he said, well, yeah, that'd be great. So they brought her out. Her name was Ruth Ann. And so I talked to her and just laid hands on her. I said, all right, that should do it. He goes, that, that, that's it? I said, yep, that's it. So she came to church the next day. 
you know, hadn't seen anything different, or, you know, but you, it was something you couldn't really see. And so <clears throat> Monday she went back to work at the hospital and they went, while she was there, she, at one point she called her husband and said, you know, I just realized uh, I haven't taken my medicine. And she said, I'm wondering, should I take it? You know, since I got prayed for, should I take my medicine? And he said, well, do you, do you feel like you need it? I mean, is it, because if she didn't take it, she would start to get dizzy and different things going on. And she said, no, I, f I feel good. He said, well, can you get them to run a, a test? And she said, yeah, because she worked there. So she said, yeah, I'll make arrangements. So she went with their x-ray uh, lab or what it was and went over there and had them x-ray. And by the time they finished the x-ray, her parathyroid had started to grow back. Both of them, they looked like little, little bitty peas. I mean, they were smaller than, you know, the thumbnail, I mean, the pinky nail there. And they had already started growing back. They were small anyway, but they started growing back. So she was all excited about it. And then <clears throat> after that, because she worked, in the, she worked in the neonatal pediatric ward, which is where they bring all the babies that have problems. And she said it had gotten so hard on her that at one point they didn't even want children. They were a young couple. And she said, we didn't want children because I'd seen so many babies come in there and die. And then they got a hold of this message. And this, they were out of the Church of Christ and had finished topping their class at their uh, Church of Christ University, Harding University out in Arkansas. And he came in on a one-day seminar on Crash Course in Divine Healing. And he said, in four, he said, in six hours, you have totally destroyed four years of college education. He said, completely destroyed all my theology. He said, my parents spent thousands of dollars to put me to that college. And in a matter of hours, you have completely destroyed that. And he said, I don't know what to tell my parents. He said, but whatever you're doing, I'm in. And eventually he ended up quitting his job and traveling with me and going around. And then later on, he moved back or was here. And uh, his company transferred him out to uh, California. And he ended up at Reading and traveled with Bill Johnson for a while. And he, he wrote to me later and said, the first thing, when Bill Johnson met him, the first thing he said, because it was on his resume that he worked with me, he said, I want you to travel with me. You're my personal assistant. He says, I want to know everything Craig Blake told you. <laughs> that was the first thing he said. <laughs> okay. So I don't think they've adopted it all, but they know it, right? And it's getting out there. That's what we're talking about today, how much this has spread. So she came back. She was at the uh, Children's Medical Center. And she said, we want to get you in there because she started praying for people, or for these babies, and they quit dying. And it got to the point where any time in the rest of the hospital a baby was going through a rough period, they would call her. And it was so funny, these doctors would say, Ruth Ann, come over here, and here's the problem, here's the situation, here's this child, now uh, do, do what you do. And they would just step back. And she said, well, all I do is lay hands and tell them to be healed. And they said, well, yeah, good, do that. And these doctors were calling her in there to pray for these babies that were dying. And she said they quit dying. And it started spreading, and they started taking note. And she said, now it's a joy to go to work. And matter of fact, she said, now we want children. I prayed for them, and now they have one, maybe even two children. I don't, I don't know. I think they had a second one. And so she said, I want to get you in the hospital. So for Christmas, they, they, we went and bought a whole bunch of stuffed animals and brought them up. And we all prayed over them, laid hands on them, and just release the life of God into them, and then we went into the hospital, walked down the halls, holding up these little animals, because you can't just walk into every room, but if you hold them up and they see you, and it's like, here, you want this, and they're like, yeah, come on in. We get in, and while we're there, we say, okay, can we pray for you? And even if we can't, we've given them a stuffed animal. We've given them a prayer cloth, right, stuffed with stuff, okay, and let the life of God go into them. So we intend to be doing that again here, to be able to get these stuffed animals, get these blankets, things like that, and give to them. And so we've seen these. That's why I called them, that's why I called this in the beginning, you know, prayer clothes. Well, you can see why, because there was no prayer cloths, per se, but there were clothes that people wore. Jesus' clothes had life in them. Paul's clothes had life in them. Any aprons, handkerchiefs, all these things had life in them. My shirt has life in it. If you realize, I did the same thing with chairs at a church we helped found up in... Um, in Sherman, they went down. They were going to put in the elders one night, and I got there early because I was working with the church. Laid hands on every chair where we were going to sit them and started praying. Just laid hands on the chair. Later, the elders came in, and within a matter of minutes, they started falling out on the floor and crying and repenting, which is good to repent before we put them in as elders. So anyway, they were repenting of all the stuff going on, and it literally changed things from that time on. So all I'm trying to get across to you. It's not about a cloth. It's not about a thing. That's just a method 
And if people have faith in it, it will work. But if we can learn to realize how big God is, it's by the Spirit of God that these prayer cloths were able to do what they did. Amen? Amen. All right, did you get anything out of this tonight? Amen. All right, let's all stand up. Father, we thank you. Your word is true. We believe your word. Father, we know that you are a God and a Father who keeps his promises. And because of that, we can have faith in you. Our faith is in you, Father. Our faith is not in our faith, but our faith is in you. Because you are so much bigger than our faith. That even if our faith should seemingly fail us at times, we know that you will not. That even if we are faithless, you are faithful. So, Father, we thank you that you do exceeding abundantly above all that we can think or ask and that you get beyond just our mere knowledge and you work in the realm of the Spirit and the realm of revelation and understanding that you are God and that you can and will do everything that you've said you will do. Father, we rest in that. We trust you. We believe you. And we are people of faith. And we know you. And we will do exploits. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you real quickly also. Father, I thank you tonight that right now in the name of Jesus, sickness and disease is an enemy of the kingdom of God. And as a representative, as an ambassador of the kingdom of God, I say now in Jesus' name, sickness and disease, you will leave, you will go, you cannot stay. Pain, false pain, torment, go in Jesus' name. I set these people free. Jesus died and bought their freedom. And we enforce that freedom tonight in Jesus' name. Be free, be healed, and be whole in Jesus' name. And everybody that agrees with me said, Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. I trust this message from the Word of God has been a blessing to you. If you need further assistance, do not hesitate to contact us at www.jglm.org or you can write to us at P.O. Box 742-947 Dallas, Texas 75374 If you need prayer requests or would like to request a prayer cloth feel free to contact us. Now right now I'm going to pray. God is going to set you free right where you are. God is not bound by time or distance. So in the name of Jesus right now I set you free. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole, be free in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. God bless you.